have this filled out. Thank you, Mike, for being here. That's a good question. Who, who's the uh, any St. George guys? Do we get any Ashley Valley guys? Anybody from the basin? Got some basin guys. Way to represent. Um, I'm from Ash Creek Special Service District. We manage the eastern half of Washington County, except for the uh, incorporated cities of Springdale, Rockville, and Lees. We manage Hurricane, Laverne, and Somerville, and all the unincorporated areas that are still uh, septic service. Um, I'll give you a brief background of my uh, enlightened path to tour. And so uh, what started out as a career in pre-med uh, ended in the operating room when I realized that the um, medical industry really sucks. I just realized I can't be in a hospital. And I spent a lot of time in school to come to that realization and um, talked to my wife and she said, you know, why don't you consider engineering? And when I looked at how many of the classes Med, counted for engineering, I was like, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll try that. Uh, I started uh, down the path for engineering at Utah State. Uh, I worked for Logan City for four years and saw some Logan guys. Uh, I came on there just as they were finishing up putting in some polishing wetlands. Uh, and towards the end of that project, I was able to work on uh, designing and then the construction and installation of their winter storage facility out by the region able to experience a lot there at Logan. Uh, I was studied at the, the water research lab at Utah State, but all of my research was in large dams, uh, dam rehabilitation, um, some of those things. Finished with my master's degree there and, and came out to work for a consulting firm right here in Salt Lake, Bone Collins and Associates. And my first day on the job, after doing all this work, I thought I'd like to you know, work on dams, work at the Bureau. Uh, the, uh, partner that I was assigned to, Larry Bowen, took me out to the north end of Utah Lake and uh, pulled up to the Bowen Harbor Loop Station. Do we have any Pimpinogas guys here? No temp guys. He said, Mike, do you smell that? And it, it was right. It was pretty bad. I said, yeah, that's terrible. He's like, that smells like money. He says, your job is to fix it. And uh, at, that, at that time, I realized that although my uh, my uh, education on the university level may have ended, the, the learning had just started. And so for the next uh, 12 years, I've continued and, and uh, I've had a really great opportunity actually. I, I would have never uh, chosen wastewater, but it's been a great career for me so far. I, uh, after working with Tim Pinogos on several plant expansions, uh, working with some of the South Valley tour guys on siting the Jordan Basin facility and um, the design of that facility. One of the great things I got to do with that is that the citizens were really concerned about odors and other things. Um, I was on the, I was the engineer assigned to essentially go visit every plant from Payson to Central Weaver. And I had to go around and take uh, a drone meter, monitoring HDS samples and things like that for hydrogen sulfide production as well as I took an acoustic engineer to monitor sound. The neighbors were really concerned about odors uh, the, the side benefit of that is I got to see every plant from Payson to Central Weaver. And it was a great opportunity to kind of see how guys did things and realize how much we can learn from each other. I, I think that's, you know, Cottonwood's manufacturing nozzles now. Let me know when I can put in my uh, order for a, a weed removal nozzle. And it's great to see as that we apply these things and we adapt. Um, I've come to realize, I, I knew this pretty early on, especially when I was in Logan City. The water guys are all kind of type A. That, that's not a fun party to attend. Wastewater is a much better place to be. So I hope you can appreciate that in your career. Uh, it's a lot funner to be on this side. And, and, and the dirty side, is the, the dark side is a lot funner than the, than the, uh, than the light side on water. Um, that being said, for the past five years, I've been uh, an office manager for uh, Bowen Collins in their St. George office. Constructed a reuse facility for the city of St. George as well as some others. And for a time, I was an industrial pretreatment consultant to Ash Creek Special Service District. Uh, some of you probably know Darwin Hall and Blair Gubler there. Darwin retired after 30 years of service.
service and, and I was hired to take his place there. So for the past two years, I've been the superintendent of Ash Creek Special Service District. And in that time, um, we've had a lot of fun opportunities. I call them fun opportunities, but as you can see, uh, the subject at hand isn't always necessarily as fun as we think. Um, I need to wake this back up. The arrow's not working either. I got stories. I can tell lots of stories. Um, you want stories? Well, so let, let's start. I, as, I, as I was asked, hey, will you talk about what to do when a backup occurs? Well, uh, being an engineer, I'm not an operator. I, th I thought, well, this is great. This is like an opportunity for me to find out what does everybody else do. So as we look at what we do in Ash Creek, where can we modify what we do and how we do and how we perform on these types of situations? When we look at backups, there's there's a whole spectrum of, of backups. I like to comment about eat more fiber. Like, yeah, that's one kind of backup. That's where it all starts. When we think of a minor backup, we get a call out. Homeowner's got a block lateral. How many of it, how many people have respond to that? Go out on a block, block lateral? Tell them that they're wrong. Yeah, so, well, so there's a couple of things there. You, you respond. You realize, okay, pull the downstream manhole, pull the upstream manhole, no, no blockage in the main, hey, it must be something in your lateral, right? The, uh, we had a complaint, well, we have an older system. I, I shouldn't say older. Uh, Mid Valley, as you said, a lot of concrete pipes. A lot of the downtown areas here, you've got old, like 100 year old systems. Some of these, uh, our system, I guess, technically relatively new, 1981, all the pipes were installed. We went through a lot of the parts of Hurricane and Hurricane and Tokerville where mains were installed. Uh, citizens were given the option to connect them up. Laterals were run, but I can tell you, you know, two months ago we went out on, a, on one and when we said, hey, well, we'll camera the lateral because we don't have a lateral map for this particular residence. So if we, usually we, we would charge a resident $45 for a lateral camera launch and go in and, and kind of map their lateral. If we don't have a map, and we'll do that, perform that service for them. So we have that on our records. Well, as we got in there, a lateral then ended in soil. Capital came in there. Uh, well, where's the sewer been going? Well, this was one of those special exceptions who came and complained to the mayor and the city council member in charge of sewer. And they, although they had a lateral and a perfectly functioning sewer in front of the house, they were still on septic in the Anybody still have septic sprinkle driver system? To get out there, and that, that's a real rude awakening to a homeowner. The, the, the person who got the exception to stay on their septic tank was three homeowners ago. And they didn't realize there was a lateral, perfectly good lateral stuff in the property. They just never connected to it. So on a minor, on a, on a, on a minor backup, it's a good thing to respond. It's a good thing to find out, pop those clean out, make sure things are hooked up, make sure it's not one of those old septic tanks that were, were left in because they were the mayor's money and they got off uh, without paying a connection fee. Let's talk about a major backup. Um, I'll give you an example from about eight months ago. Uh, I get a call, and, and you guys here in Salt Lake and really the Watt Patch Fund area, uh, hopefully most of the time you're able to handle these things yourself, but occasionally you have to call on, a, on a, another agency. Uh, we have a city that's just outside that has a major national park, and uh, we got a call saying, hey, there's raw sewage sheet flowing across SR9, and they don't have, they don't have any cleaning. They, they usually will contract with Twin B, come down and clean their, their system, and so we responded, got out there, just so happened that the night before, finishing up the ship, the UDOT operator who was rough grading the side of the road, the shoulders, hit the ring, right? Cracked the collar, collar broke, went down the manhole, big chunks of concrete, sat there all night, backed up the sewer, and there was raw sewage running across. Now, the problem is, you know, when you have that kind of a backup or somebody hits that, and then the, the, the driver says, whoops, and it doesn't look like it's too bad. Went and parked the grader and went home for the night. Didn't call anybody. Um, bigger problem happens when when that mantle backs up and uh, runs down the, the gutter, enters a storm drain, and then uh, ends up at the detention base that is the community site. 
Doc Park. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, the, usually the mayor's house backs too. So that's, that's a little more major backup. That's a problem where we've got raw sewage, exposure to the public, and those types of things. Let's talk for a minute about ca catastrophic backup. Pump failure, prolonged power outages, water overload. Okay. When we talk about those types of things, I should have scrubbed that off. I, I left the name on the door. Uh, what are the keys to a rapid and adequate response? How many of you have one person you keep on call? How many have a team of two people? So we, we have one person, but what we find is it's a real challenge that most of the times if you're having a call out, uh, especially where uh, we, we cover a large area, very, very dispersed area, is that if there's anything that needs to be done with a, a back truck, uh, getting into an electrical cabinet, to troubleshoot the pump station, that can be a real challenge if there's just one guy. Especially if they need to play with the, the electrical system. That should be a team of two guys. And so that's something that we're reviewing right now is going to a two-man team. For a long time, me and rural communities, we've had one guy on call uh, with, as, as that call shifts, like we kind of do the implicit, hey, who's going to be around just in case? We've got everybody, all the rest of the crew on quote-unquote soft call. If you're around, you may get called out. Um, so you've got on a minor response, it may just be the on-call operator dispatched to investigate. Goes out, lateral back up to the home, hey, go call the local phone. On a major response, you know, when you have an operator show up in a situation like this, this, this is a pump station, by the way. Uh, this was a storm. Does everybody know where Harrisburg is? Come down, you know where Quail Lake is, St. George. So just as, as you back out, there's a little, if you come down I-15, there's some RV homes, there's a little KOA campground. So this is a small little subdivision that uh, in a matter of about two hours got like two inches of water. Massive rain, big wrecks on I-15 with this storm. This was October of 2015. The drainage that came through Harrisburg and the KOA actually floated and, and crushed the, uh, the culvert that went under the driveway. It lifting the asphalt, uh, it lifted the manhole that there was no, it never poured a collar around the manhole. And so the manhole is lifted and when the, when the culvert collapsed, all of the storm water coming from the drainage in that area went right into our lift station. So this is what my operator pulled up to. The door had been forced open, our generator was inundated, and luckily, you can see we have a burner all the way around this, this area, but we were, yeah, that was one where the, uh, the milking boots weren't enough, you needed the hip boots to get in on that one. Um, it was a bad situation. Catastrophic response, uh, rapid response text, for radio all operators, uh, do you guys have like a rapid response text system? Where, you can, where an operator of the on-call phone can send a text to all their operators, kind of, hey, everybody that's available, come out. Anybody have that? How do you respond to a, something major? Is it just one by one? So it goes to the boss or whoever's DRC. So when, when you guys arrive on site, and this is usually something you define in your, your sanitary sewer management plan is, um, when we arrive on site to a backup, the responding operator is the DRC essentially for that event. He operates, he coordinates the effort. All other guys who arrive later are under his command and control until you know the end of the, that event. So that's the way we manage when we have backups in, in Ash Creek. But when we look at a catastrophic event, uh, rapid response text for radio all operators. Um, an example, two examples I'll give you of this is uh, we received a call last September. Uh, you know, and this, this came out later in the news, but uh, 16 people lost down Shore Creek, Hilldale, Colorado City. We need help. We've lost all sewer service. Uh, the creek that the families went down and were lost, uh, crossing on the bridge there at Shore Creek, carried the sewer main. Uh, 
sewer main was blocked off completely, half of it was missing, and Ash Creek, Washington City, St. George City, all this one of them are back trucks. Uh, it took us three days of jacking out sand and junk in those main lines to restore uh, flow in their, in their main lines. And in addition to adding to put to reinstalling two or three sticks of, of pipe. Um, they, they were they were in kind of a hurt situation. Uh, similar with the flooding in St. George. Uh, manholes popped in, in uh, Santa Clara Diamonds and essentially had the Santa Clara River. Uh, we were pulling catfish off the screens of St. George's Sand. And so when you have that kind of a catastrophic backup or failure within your system, what is the mechanism that you that you use to respond? And do you have those types of mechanisms? The reason being, well, let's, I'll get to the reasons, but let's talk about diagnosing. When you go to diagnose a minor uh, backup, this is this is my uh, shout out to Sarah and the pretreatment. You know, the great thing about pretreatment is no self-respecting sewer guy ever wants to have to do pretreatment. Like, it's a hard job. Is it not a hard job? Can you eat at any establishment? In <laughs> Yeah, you, you, you ostracize it. My guys, they've got to go down to the St. George. The St. George guys have to come up to where we are to eat. You don't want to, you never know what's going to be put in your food when you're there. They remember your name. They remember your face. Uh, so when you get in to diagnose a backup, you've got a minor, you know, you pop the upstream, downstream manhole, and say we've got mainline blockage or this is just a lateral situation. Work with the industry or, or the commercial establishment or the homeowner to, to clear their lateral. Uh, this is a nice big grease plug. On a, on a major backup, how do, how do you guys do it? You have a major backup, not go off. Anybody had a sewer coming out the top? Give us a little, give us a short background and then, and then tell us how you responded. So in that type of a situation, was it, was it just something you were already on site, or did you get a call out and somebody was watching something, hey, we've got stuff coming up? Uh, hurricane waves took out my power pole, so half our system was out of power, back to the main board, and I was just... Yeah, pump's not running, so you got sewer in the wet well rising. Uh, those, those are significant issues. How did you bypass that? How are you able to, to troubleshoot? Um, you know, when, when we talk about the, uh, the mainline blockages, what we found is about 60% of mainline blockages end up being something in the manhole. And that's from the concrete collar, the greater operator chucks and left, to uh, the, the gentleman who must have cleaned out his garage and thought, what can I do with this spare tire and the 80 feet of barbed wire that I've had sitting around? Uh, we strung that out of a manhole not too long ago. If you can get in, try to try to get your camera deployed downstream, work its way back up, so you can document. We had we had a homeowner call out. There was blockage. There was blockage on the main line. So what started as a minor, we ended up having sewer surcharging. It didn't overflow, but we got the camera deployed to see what was creating the blockage. It was past the manhole upstream, coming up from downstream. There was a two by four sticking out of the lateral. So, and, and then uh, once we showed him the video and, and he confessed to the, the basement remodel we've been working on, uh, it, was, it was clear that, you know, when, when it first backed up in his basement and we found it backing up into our lines, uh, you know, there was a lot of, of cursing and, and uh, oath making of how the district was going to pay. But once the once the video showed you've got a six foot two by four that's made it through your lateral and sticking into our main line, uh, it, was, it was pretty simple to see that there was not any responsibility being borne by the district. That's that's one thing as you have operators respond to these too is you need to be careful. Well, not just be careful, but avoid assigning any type of responsibility to yourself or the homeowner as you as you respond. 
it's important that you say, look, we're still diagnosed. I can't give you a conclusive statement right now of what's happening because we need more information. There's just not enough information to give you a clear picture that way. Catastrophic. Same is kind of major, but it may include deployment of bypass pumping setups, high repair materials, heavy equipment. For us, uh, being somewhat remote, uh, St. George City has actually bought two large pump trailers. Um, we haven't had to call on them, but, but essentially they can bypass a significant amount of water. They have a trailer with, I think, about six or 800 feet of aluminum pipe on big tall couplers that they can deploy in about 45 minutes. Uh, they do a great job. They, and, and essentially what started out for them as a call to rain for rent, which for us, that rain for rent out of Las Vegas was the closest thing. And, and this, this harps all the way back to the 2005 flood, the 2010 flood, the 2012 flood. Um, all over time, you realize, okay, we need to invest in how these, these things on site. So bypass pumps can be able to handle large flows, get around block manholes or sections of pipe that are completely out. Um, and that's, that's kind of the reality that, that we face down with the monsoons and the real heavy rains. I think as much as we see that though, uh, from what I've seen of the, of the weather up here, uh, similar patterns happen. Monsoon rains are becoming more violent, uh, higher intensity, longer duration events, and, and those are the events that, that uh, can cause problems for us when we do. Uh, heavy equipment. What's the heaviest? Uh, track hose, front loaders? What do we got equipment like? Everybody kind of have basic backhoe. Um, an interesting thing happened. Um, yeah, you never know what you may find, right? And it's so staged, but it's great. You, you, the, the manhole lid, there was a great one from somewhere back east where they actually had a, uh, a, a crocodile coming out of the manhole. At least the image looked that way. And, and he was pulling a child back in. <laughs> That's pretty funny, actually. I mean, if you're a sewer guy, it's like like your wife won't think that's very funny, but it is pretty good. Um, when we talk about getting to that point where we're doing the repairs, okay, you may hey call a private plumber. That's your issue. You know, you got roots in your lateral, you got some other blockage, some grandma to quit flushing the base grease. You know, I for for the, the interesting thing was uh, we had been hit. Uh, three, four months, we were getting heavy grease loads, heavy grease loads, to the point that we started tracking. And as we tracked it back through the system, um, came to this nice little residential cul de sac. And I don't know what they were cooking back there, but it essentially it was, it was down to a single house. And I don't know if they were uh, running a food operation out of the house or not, but uh, we talked to the police, they wouldn't talk to. Uh, the homeowner and, and things improved, but um, that, that's what it came down to. It was, it was a, it was a, a uh, home occupation business that was really hitting us. Uh, and so, again, sometimes those minor repairs can be the source of some of the bigger problems in your collection system or in your treatment facility. A major repair, repair by operators, may require some additional trades. Um, you know, Mid Valley, you guys said you have nine guys. We're about that side. We have 12 guys. Um, challenges, we cover about 1,000 square miles. Uh, we cover, you know, pump stations, other things. One of the things that is a real challenge for us being so uh, geographically isolated, um, we have about one electrician. Washington County is willing to respond, assuming he's not at a grandson's birthday party or something else. So we have an electrician on staff. Um, we try to we try to self perform as much as we can because we are we don't have supporting contractors uh, in our proximity. As, as much as St. George in that area is growing, it's still pretty isolated. Um, major catastrophic repair. We talk about uh, support from agency and other contractors. As as I've mentioned several times now, we've seen 
multiple opportunities, whether it's going out to support Hobel, Colorado City, Rockville, something at the, at the park, um, up to Bryant at with some of the challenges they faced, or down to St. George, and they've, and they've returned, they've reciprocated that way. Maintaining good relationships with your with your respective agencies across your borders is an important thing. Um, how many of you have ever had a FEMA event? Do you want to give us a quick, quick story? Yeah, so, so this one didn't affect Ash Creek directly, but it, it affected me personally in that I lived in the area. Some of you may require, remember just a few years ago, there was a large detention dam in Santa Clara. And the uh, dam started piping fine material out, and they evacuated the lower part of Santa Clara, and the dam broke. It ended up inundating about, I think it was 68 homes because the FEMA threshold is 75. If you don't get 75, you may want to get one of these homes. And uh, while I was help, helping neighbors muck out of stuff, I, I remember a, a neighbor saying, I mean, the, the water was coming up in this house. It was, it was uh, we were down in the basement trying to get stuff out there. And, I don't know how to take care of this. And he grabbed a sledgehammer and he just hit the toilets. Bam. Well, the water started going down. Um, but I, it, it's, it's those types of things that unanticipated discharges that we can get as you create backups. How do you respond to that? In a FEMA type event, uh, last, last year, September, last year, Washington County emergency responders, as well as a lot of the, the uh, utilities who support. Um, the infrastructure in that area went to Emmitsburg, Maryland, to the FEMA facility. And, uh, has anybody been back to Emmitsburg? Well, some of you have. Good, good experience, isn't it? I mean, they do some fantastic training. One of the things I didn't realize, and especially where, like I said, we're so geographically isolated, is that when you have a FEMA type event, and let's say, you know, in a matter of minutes, my two backhoes, the front loader, all three backer trucks are deployed, and I, I, I need some more machinery. Well, right across from me, from me at the, the county fairgrounds and then just downstream from Quail Creek is, is the, our cat dealer. Well, let me go call the Caterpillar dealer. Let me call, let me call Hanna. Hey, get me some track loads up here. Uh, when you do that type of a thing, does FEMA reimburse you? You, you said it. Both of you kind of did, but you talked over each other. Uh, back there, what'd you say? Yeah, so if you have a FEMA type event, a, a big event, if you don't have pre-signed uh, contracts in place, the, in the number of times that FEMA has dealt with price gouging and other issues uh, restricts them from reimbursing you for anything that happens that's not, that doesn't, isn't performed on a pre-existing contract. So I go out and I sign contract with Caterpillar or with Han and it said, yeah, we'll supply these pieces of machinery at these prices and I get an annual price list. I call Rain for, for rent out of Las Vegas because they're closer to Salt Lake and I say, hey, this is our, these are our, our pumps, our bypass, our major tanks, all these things. This is what we supply and this is what we, our, our price list is so that on a moment's notice, I can call and if it's the type of thing, it's a big enough scenario. I, I, can, I can recoup some of that. Otherwise, I've got to eat all that. I have no way to recoup any of that cost. So if, if, uh, for those of you who are in administration and things that way, or those of you who are making those decisions, crew supervisors and things that way, make sure your equipment's operating correctly, make sure it's in good condition, but uh, in, in a real situation, you'll quickly be overwhelmed. And if you've got a call on additional equipment, if it's not from another sister agency, and you don't have an agreement, if it's Mid Valley, South Valley or, or or Salt Lake Suburban Number One or something, then then all of a sudden you have a reimbursement agreement with those folks. Is it, is it, a, is it a you know a good neighbor act of goodwill or is this the type of thing that hey we've had this crew out here for three days we need to be reimbursed somehow if that's possible. So think about those as you think about the uh, the backups and the, and the range. You know a, a simple homeowner response versus catastrophic is very different. Oftentimes, we're, we're conditioned to respond to the homeowner and the little lateral walk-up. 
maybe we've trained to respond to something a little more major, but often we found ourselves ill prepared for a catastrophic type event. After we've experienced a, a, a backup, we need to look at a couple of things. For a minor, look at the chronic issues that may need to be addressed through standard operation and maintenance. Uh, if need be, if it's the type of thing a homeowner's going to file a claim, probably need to contact the trust or whoever your insurer is. Um, hopefully, if they're here, you're either insurer, right? If not, I'm sure Brad can help you find the policy that fits your. Uh... That, that being said, one of the experience, one of the challenges we have, Sandy area, if you've been out to Sand Hollow Reservoir, uh, Dixie Springs area, uh, with the, the, the Sand Hollow Reservoir was intended to be a recharge to the groundwater, a benefit to our groundwater resources. But what we find is in select areas, that water has come up quicker than in areas in others. And, and sewer trench we laid 10 years ago is now in groundwater. And the district is drilling wells and trying to bring that down. And, but what the challenge that brings is all of a sudden, as we go through cleaning in that area, we find sand dunes in our pipes. And not only is some of that infiltration into our sewer manholes, but some of that is homeowners put in basement sumps and just connected it to their sewer line. A legal connection. So I've got to go out there, we send our, our cleaning crew out there every six months because we got to clean sand dunes out of the main line coming from that hole. That's one of the challenges that we recognize in that area. other areas, old parts of the city here, throughout the Wasatch Front, you get the old roots, the big trees. Um, I, I like the question about, did you kill the tree? I, I think, I don't want to confess this, but I may or may not have been involved in the killing of the oldest tree in Cache Valley down the island at one point with a, uh, and, and it was actually a curving gutter project. But I, I wasn't the engineer who signed off on it, but uh, it, it, people, people get sentimental, sentimentally attached to these things. And so, and, and it's, not a, it's not a small thing. When you have a major backup or overflow, notify the Division of Water Quality. Let's talk for a minute, SSOs, we mentioned sanitary sewer overflows. Um, class one, bad one. Big one. What what what's the what's the response on a class one SSO? Anybody know? How much time do we have to give them a heads up? What's up? Twenty four hours. So you're out there to respond and you got twenty four hours to get to call in and say, Hey guys, we got a problem. Uh, probably a, a public health department. We have a remote pump station. Uh, it's on the end of a power spur, and for some reason, Rocky Mountain Power in our area does not uh, put a very high priority on service. And so that, that pump station got knocked out. The on-call operator responded, made sure the power was on. Uh, he didn't pump the pumps. Went back home. The lights come on. Everything appeared. Everything on the panel was fine. Uh, the next morning, we got a call from a homeowner, and this is in a pretty remote location. She's like, I've been hearing that. There's something beeping for about an hour now. Well, it was our sewer alarm, and uh, the pumps were perfectly fine. It was a phase relay, just a phase relay of the panel that didn't allow the pump to kick on. It, was, it, it defaulted in the shutdown. Condition. It was just it was a faulty phase relay, and we ended up having a class one SSO. So we were backed up, ended up going down to the Virgin Creek, which ends in, and they ended up going to the Virgin River. We're doing a cleanup. We're calling the state. We're going through the whole process. So as you look at those types of situations, you say, okay, what who do I need to notify? Does the on-call operator or at least the on-call phone have a direct dial to DWQ? Who's at the public health department? Again, who's at the trust if I need to notify them if there's going to be any claims involved or issues that way? When we talk about catastrophic, same as major, but additional documentation may be required to avoid fines. You need to make sure that you're staying on top of those things. I, I appreciate the, the, uh, the GIS system. It's a great way to be able to track what you're doing. You know, it, it's, it's something that is becoming more and more kind of the expectation that it, it's difficult to clean camera and document the condition of your system if it's, if it's not something that's graphical right in front of your face and says, hey, these are your 15 critical manholes. 
that it's time to get these on the budget. They need to be replaced. These are the 15 weak areas or 20, and it, it's too hard to go back when you look at the mass volume of CDs that guys have filed and say, well, what do we need to focus on this year? And everybody kind of looks around and says, well, I think this part of the system is pretty bad. Yeah, it's clay line. Maybe we ought to slip line and maybe we ought to replace it. Get that GIS system in place and update it as, as best you can. Um, finally, public education about the proper use of sewer systems so we can reduce fat soils, grease, racks, diapers, those things that consistently cause blockages and backups. Pre treatment inspections and outreach. Um, I have a great pre treatment discharger that, that does. Uh, Probably probably does half the salad dressing in the Western U.S. And, and it's, uh, it's good salad dressing. Except when your plants smell like ranch. Uh, <laughs> that's a little nasty. Challenge is, comes down past Quail Creek into a pump station where I sit and that pump station actually has to cycle twice before my portion makes clear. It's a long portion. So by the time it gets to the end of that, it's pretty ripe. When it discharges into that manhole and, we, and, and then coming into the plant, um, I mean, have any of you guys done odor studies, hydrogen sulfide? What's your long, what's your worst manhole or what's your worst concentration? Uh, we have a So so this this particular pump station now salad dressing, they have a pretreatment facility. They they take out all of the as much as they can of the TSS. They, they most of the time they're they're fog is zero. Their TSS is 100, under 100, but they're soluble. That means the dissolvable portion of their, their sugars, their, their other things, is, is around 2,000. And, uh, and when that sits in a, man, in, a, in a wet well, and then sits in a, in a force main for three, four hours before it comes up, that manhole was regularly getting hits of 900 parts per million hydrogen sulfide. Now, if you, if you look at the OSHA recommendations that were mentioned, uh, about 800, you hit that lethal limit, like pulmonary edema, your, your lungs and your, and your eyes and your brain start swelling, and it's like you're trying to breathe and you just went straight to the top of Mount Everest, start filling your body up with, with fluid. Uh, so pretreatment and, and being aware of those things is a very important thing. And as we look at education, not only of the public, but education of your operators, you know, I've seen too many guys, you know, be the hero and say, oh yeah, let me jump down that manhole. And do you know what the hydrogen sulfide content was in that manhole five minutes ago or what it is right now? So be aware, education is, a, is an important thing. And oftentimes in the heat of the moment, we see a blockage, we see that sewer blowing across that sort of nine, we see those types of things happen. And it's very tempting to be reactionary, but, but that's a foolish decision to make. Uh, there's a great presentation on removal of tree roots. Uh, let me know when your nozzle heads are in production. I've got a couple areas I can apply those. Uh, removal laterals, connections that are abandoned and, and may cause problems in the future, and then cor correct any illegal plumbing connections. Um, roof drains, other things that, that can end up entering into your sewer system. Um, really, that's, that's kind of the, the gist of my presentation today was as you look at uh, a sewer backup, really take into account there's a wide range of, of, of options there. Oftentimes we are best prepared for the simple and, and when it's a homeowner that's you know, kind of in a bad situation, maybe we can provide a little bit of support, but it's, it's gonna be for the most part up to that homeowner as we get into major or catastrophic sized backup uh, and problems that way. It takes, some, it takes some planning and some education of your operators in order to respond in a way that protects the public, gives proper notification, there's proper protection for your operators way that you can get some financial recourse if it's the type of thing that becomes a hardship for you. Any other questions or discussion items? And that's the great thing about being right before lunch. It's like everybody, yes, we're hungry. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Mike, great job on that. It's, it's really informative, and that's what we're here for, is to learn some new things. Uh, we do have lunch that's getting set up right now, and in the meantime, we're going to have a little brief presentation. I'm going to have Jason introduce you. Thanks, guys. We're going to push you. You know what they say about good food, right? It takes time. This better be really good food. <laughs>
<laughs> we had a little delay in getting lunch here, so what we're setting up, uh, we we scheduled this for for the end of the, for the end of this presentation. We have two representatives here from ARS. They're one of our one of our great partners when it comes to responding to the overflows and backups that uh, that we uh, that we talked about today, and uh, and they want to just talk a little bit about what they do when they show up on on scene. Maybe show you some pictures to get you primed up for lunch. <laughs> so. Um, we have we have Jonas Harmon here and uh, and Andrew both I lost it Andrew Smith how can I forget Smith um, from ARS and and uh, we've got them all primed up ready to go um, in terms of time over them we really appreciate their work um, in trying to minimize the amount of cost and damage that that, that happens when when a backup when a backup occurs that's sometimes it happens and uh, and having quick response. And having having professional uh, partners there to work to clean it up is really important. So here you go, Jonas. All right. So I'm Jonas Harmon. I'm the senior excavator for ARS Flood and Cleanup. Been there for about 12 years. Um, this is Andrew Smith. He's also an estimator for the company. We're out of the Ogden office. We are not the uh, marketing team, so we are the guys that do the work. So, not a public speaker. Um, and we're going to jam through a three hour presentation in about five to ten minutes. So, I took out all the boring stuff and I left some fun photos in there. <coughs> You'll like that. Lunch. So, what we're going to talk about is water mitigation. We're going to go through the classes of water, the categories of water, different than the classes and categories that you guys do, but it'll give you an idea of how we approach things. Um, when we come out, if you know, the city calls us, we come out and set the situation and how we dry out the structures. Um, we do both residential and commercial, as you'll see. So, First thing we do when we come on site is we stop the source of water. Um, if it's a main line, we have you know we we have resources where we call in the utilities or the plumbing plumbers have them stop the source of water because we can't do our job if the water's still coming. Um, this also goes for sewage. Um, we will do whatever we can to get that source stopped. Uh, inspection. We want to know where the water came from. Um, has it been, you know, located, stopped, and then what is the category? We'll go into what the categories are here in a minute. What is the class of the lot? Um, that's just, you know, how much water we determine to be in the structure. Uh, then we just determine how much is wet, what's affected, what we need to do. We're not, it, it, with anything, technology advances. So we're not coming out to the homes that are affected with water. We're not coming up and tapping the uh, wall and saying, yep, there's water in there. You know, we're not, we don't have professional sniffers. We don't come and say it smells wet in here. And you can build the humidity, but we use, we use technology to our advantage to find the water, to dry out the structure. Ultimately, if we dry out the structure, we save money. So if it comes to city liability, that's cheaper for the cities and uh, all insurance companies, everybody. So. We're trying to reduce damage and the amount of money that's being spent. Here's just a couple of instruments that we use. These are moisture meters. The big one on the left here we use to uh, find moisture in carpet. The one on the right is what we use to find in the walls. Not all of them have the prongs on them, so because we like to not prod everything, because that causes damage. We don't want to do that. This here is just another moisture meter that we put up the wall and it's going to tell us the moisture content of building materials. This one is a hydrometer. So this is going to tell us some of our, our atmospheric readings, our relative humidity, the air temperature, and things like that. We use science, um, psychometrics, to determine the best way to dry out the structures, um, get the building materials dried out quicker. This helps us do that. Um, more moisture reading materials. This is a uh, 
This will help do hardwood floors, and you'll see in later pictures we can save gym floors. Um, this helps us do this. This is thermal imaging camera. I'm sure you guys have seen these before. Nothing new to you guys. Um, there's four quick principles of drying. Remove the excess water. If there's standing water, we're not going to dry out the structure as fast. We need to get that out. Two is evaporation, airflow. That's where you see all our fans that we put into the homes and buildings that get the air movement. That helps evaporation occur. Dehumidification, that's our big machines that we're going to put in there to remove that moisture from the air and then it pumps it out. And then temperature. So all of those things, um, those four things are crucial to drying. And if you think of it as a dryer in your home, right, you've got the, the spin cycle to get rid of the excess moisture and that's in the washing machine, right? And you go to the dryer and it's going to have airflow pumping into that drum. Then we have the dehumidification that's the vents of the dryer pumping that wet air out. And then you have heat, either gas or electric, you know, causing heat. All those four things are necessary to uh, dry out the structure. Here's our categories of water losses. You guys are familiar with uh, RVing, camping, boating, things like that. You have three types of water on your, on your vessel, right? You have clean water, gray water, and black water. Okay, the clean water we can drink. The gray water, that's like anything that goes down the sink, maybe your dishwasher. Um, in residential terms or a building terms, that is, you know, maybe it's weaver water from a sprinkler system that ran into a home. We consider those category two losses. Category three, those are the fun ones. I think that's what you guys are dealing with today is sewers. Um, that's the black water. There's a lot of different ways that people approach cat one and cat two. You know, um, insurance companies look at it as well. It, it didn't come from the sewer, it's, it's clean water. My, my question then is would you drink it? Because I'm not going to drink anything that ran through the dishwasher, pretty sure. Those are our categories. Now we're going to get into some pictures, just some, some things that we see. Uh, quarter inch supply line pumping out. You'd be amazed at how much that quarter inch could flood. Uh, we did a job for Utah State University, the University A. Quarter inch supply line on the dishwasher on the sixth floor flooded, and it flooded 68 rooms, and it only ran for three hours, and it flooded all six levels. That was a good job. We spent close to 16 hours a day there for a week. Get them back in. Just more clean water um, accumulating through the carpet, hard the solid surface flooring. Here's where we get into the fun stuff. So our guys like Andy have to be this guy, crawl around in the crawl space. And that is uh, that's one of the nastier jobs. We fully protected PPE. We've got to get that out of the home. Um, somebody has to do it. I'm not going to do it. I've done it. So it's, uh, it's a good one. Right before lunch. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> Did anybody walk into a hoarder house? The best thing about the hoarder house is when, is when they have a sewage flood. It's just everything your worst, your worst nightmare reality. Um, yeah, everything goes. If it's, if it's touched by sewage, there's no saving it. A lot of times we do these people a favor by coming in, cleaning it up, getting rid of everything. We can come back six months later and it's all started over again, unfortunately. So, this is Andy's room. A little bit of mold on the uh, back side of the cabinet here. I mean, this is pretty standard. These plumbing lines are on this exterior wall. They sometimes, uh, when cabinet makers put their cabinets into a home, they'll pop a pinhole into that into that pipe, or they'll drive a nail into it, and it'll seal for a while. 
And then after a while, that nail will rust away and spring the leak. So it just pops into the back of that drywall, affecting that cabinet. Um, every insurance is different. Um, yeah, basically, there's no, there's no saving that area. You got to pull them out, pull all the cabinets out, cut all the drywall, treat the studs, remove the insulation, get the plumbing fixed. Pretty nasty stuff there. More bulbs, mushrooms. That's a pretty. Once mushrooms are there, it's pretty bad deal. I've walked into jobs and the mushrooms will like open up and then release like a gap. Time to walk out of that to make sure they're fully suited so I don't need to be taking that stuff home. Classes of water. So we talked about the categories of water. Now we're going to do the classes. Oops, there's four classes that I'll let Andy talk about this. So. Sick of it making fun of my room. So I'm going to we deal with uh, four different kinds of classes, basically. I'll just work this here. So basically, we have class one, two, three, and four. Let's start right there. We look at them as um, basically how much is affected. Class one is the most, or excuse me, class one least amount of water. Class four is the most amount of water. So as we go through and deal with these different projects, we class them that way. And insurance company, uh, that's how we determine the amount of equipment we place on the job is by the class of water. Here we have uh, a high class here that basically when it starts to pop down, comes all the way down through. This is a class four. Uh, this is like what you talked about when we get a you know a six floor deal where it goes through, starts through and hits uh, ceilings, walls, and floors. Um, these are some of the systems that we use in large losses like hotels and things like that. Commercial buildings to help dry out the wall cavities without cutting out wallpaper, without cutting out the walls, uh, protecting and making it quick and efficient for, for the customer. This is more of our wall drying equipment, um, our dehumidifiers, our fans that we do use these to pump wall directly up. And we can, with these, we can actually draw, draw the top of a 10 foot cavity drywall. We can dry it all the way up without any issues. Um, just more of that. This was the City Creek Mall project. Which one is this? This project was a pretty unique project. It happened at night. We got the call in the morning and showed up and saw the mall. Massive amount of water. So there was anywhere, just depending on the floor, um, you know, six inches of water throughout the whole thing. And all the drains in the building were backed up. So we just got that. We got a drive within two days um, by using these specialty, the specialty equipment. These are depth and dehumidifiers. Um, we rent those out and pump desiccant air, desiccant air to dry up air that's fine. Machines run anywhere between two hundred fifty thousand to five hundred thousand dollars. They have to come in on semi trucks and put up. This is uh, this is our painting of gym floors. So we do a lot. We pull one of the exclusive contractors from the LDS Church and. The gyms always work. We come in, we take their floors. We're saving them you know, $150,000 for the flooring if it has to be torn out by the gym. Gym floors are pretty expensive to keep. There, some of our equipment, extraction equipment, our drying equipment. So we don't call them fans because everybody has a fan. We call them air movers. Um, they pump out way more air volume than your average fan does. What we have stock um, force, force air movers here, dehumidification, force floor. That's a gym. You have a tenant. We have our own atmosphere. Dryers. We keep this dry. Then our dehumidifiers. This is what we use to remove the moisture out of the air. We also can add heat to the home. We have big trailer heated now. Air conditioning. Go out, death sensors, trailer mounted death sensors, land voice mapper. On all jobs that we go to, it's a 
So, you know, we're not coming in and we're just guessing and saying this is what we do with this sign. What's your map versus program that we use? We draw up the map of the building, everything, and then we calculate the area, the volume, everything, all the measurements go to the building for housing. And we plug it into this moisture mapper, and it tells us how much we put in that building. So, we may adapt more improvements into those buildings and drive the structure, but when we come back and solve reference, Moisture mapper, it's going to tell us you had too much in there, you can only have this, 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 and this. So I only color it because it's this, this. Right? So hopefully, I got the structure dry in the past. You know, and hopefully, so that the homeowner, the business owner, the city, the state, the church, whoever our client is, we're not going to come out to put as much equipment in there as we possibly can to make as much money as we possibly can. We're doing it the right way. Yeah. Hopefully, help out. Anybody have any questions? They're all hungry, though.